Revum. This is the Rex Monthly Check-In Call, Wednesday, July 10th, 2019. No idea how it got to 2019, but it is. It is what it is. And I have a poem for us by Louise Gluck, or Gluck, if you were to speak German and use the umlaut, uh, titled Telescope. I will put the link right now in our chat so you can follow along if you'd like. There we go. Telescope by Louise Gluck. There's a moment after you move your eye away when you forget where you are, because you've been living, it seems, somewhere else in the silence of the night sky. You've stopped being here in the world. You're in a different place, a place where human life has no meaning. You're not a creature in a body. You exist as the stars exist, participating in their stillness, their immensity. Then you're in the world again, at night on a cold hill, taking the telescope apart. You realize afterward, not that the image is false, but the relation is false. You see again how far away each thing is from every other thing. Let me read it again. Telescope by Louise Gluck. There is a moment after you move your eye away when you forget where you are, because you've been living, it seems, somewhere else in the silence of the night sky. You've stopped being here in the world. You're in a different place, a place where human life has no meaning. You're not a creature in a body. You exist as the stars exist, participating in their stillness, their immensity. Then you're in the world again, at night, on a cold hill, taking the telescope apart. You realize afterward not that the image is false, but the relation is false. You see again how far away each thing is from every other thing. I'm glad you read that again. Always bears, always bears the double, the double uh, reading. Um, hey, SD. Hey, April. Hey, Todd. Everybody, remember you're muted by default when you came in. Um, I am, I am at my mom's right now. She had a new, brand shiny new high technology hip installed on Monday. Uh, hip was. The installation was done like 10.30 in the morning. She was on her feet at six, because that's what they do now. Um, if you're going to have some kind of operation on your body, recommend it's your hip, because other things seem to be a lot messier. Um, things are going pretty well, so other than my mom being stubborn like horse. Um, but, you know, there we are. And so I thought we'd do a little round of check-in and see where we are in uh, Rexy things in our lives, just as we normally do, and figure out what's, uh, what's, in, our, what's in our lives this moment. And Jamey, it sounds like you're just coming off a flu or? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah that's what's just around um, July. And I thought I had managed to dodge that bullet, but uh, apparently not. So I've uh, spent um, most of the last three days sleeping um but i have some work i need to get done today in fact i may even need to drop out a little bit early uh but um yeah here i am yay <laughs> and and as opposed to your usual uh movie announcer voice you now have like dr doom voice which is awesome oh, right. he's right. totally kissing your man say <laughs> say we should keep bombing laos mr president say that <laughs> say that <tonight. laughs> We should keep bombing Laos and perhaps the other countries around just to make sure. Just for fun. Um, and like Latin, there's another one of these Latin American countries has elected somebody a little too far to the left. Let's, let's, throw, let's overthrow them. Let's make sure he kills himself with <laughs> shooting himself in the back, pausing only once to reload. Uh, Anything, Rexy, on your, on your radar? Uh, any of the things you've been putting together? Well, you know what? Actually... I think the, the Rexiest thing of late for me is a TV show. Mm. Have any of you watched uh, The Good Place? I've yes. heard of it, but not watched it. It is a, you know, ostensibly a, you know, I don't even call it a sitcom. Um, it is funny-ish. Kristen Bell stars uh, along with uh, Ted Danson, a few other folks. And uh, it, at the beginning of the series, she find, you know, she's dead. And she finds that she's in the good place. And um, over the course of the multiple seasons, uh, she discovers all is not what it seems. 
what's particularly rexy about it is, uh, at least from my perspective, is how much it dives deep into out and out philosophy. As in one of the characters is a moral philosopher who's trying to teach people how to be good. And so we get in, you know, comparatively, especially for television, in-depth yeah. discussions of Kierkegaard and the trolley problem and all sorts of things that you never would have anticipated showing up on a mainstream, you know, broadcast network TV show aimed at a general audience. And it's, you know, surprisingly in-depth. I thought that, that the, the, uh, attention that they paid to the trolley problem while it was funny was also really well done and you know really addressed the issues in a way that um frankly it was better than i've seen in a lot of other discussions of that because that that issue has come up quite a bit around self-driving cars uh so it the first two seasons is are available on netflix third season is coming out shortly on dvd and presumably streaming the fourth and last season starts in September. And I was oh, just cool. like surprisingly pleased. Uh, Janice and I uh, binge watched over the weekend. And, um, you know, if you have a chance to sit, sit back and just watch TV for a bit, it's worth watching. Sweet. My assumption was that Ted Danson could only be in hell, not like in the good place. So uh, it's like, ah, miscast somehow, but it's not, apparently well, it's really good. Oh, it's not miscast. Really? No, 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 no spoilers. But. Oh, okay, 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 cool. So, ah, intriguing. Yeah, what's yeah. nice about the show is it tricks you because yeah, it has the banal version of what heaven would be, you know, with all its banality and what the, you know, the bourgeois would think. And I'm just going to leave it there. Yeah. So did so did Big Bang Theory open up a crack in the universe in the world of sitcoms so that somebody could do something that was a simultaneously silly and maybe serious? Um, or maybe no, not. Big Bang? S- silly and serious have been to, have been um, the sour and sweet of of uh, media for quite some time. I don't think that's the the combination. I think the combination is you know, comparatively silly and uh, thoughtful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, something with some sophisticated ideas. I don't know how much Big Bang Theory really got into the sophisticated ideas because I only watched it when Will was on it. Um, one of the episodes where Will Wheaton was on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, anyway. Well, anyway. While yeah. we're talking TV. Oh, good. And as silly and sweet, um, I find myself watching this uh, Catch-22 ah. uh, series on whatever it is, Hulu. And it is normally I avoid things made from books, particularly books that were important. And this is really unbelievably well done. And it's not that many episodes, so it's not a life commitment. It's, uh, it's quite astounding. And very dark. Uh, yes, but very uh, silly. I mean, very, it's not silly. It walks that fine line between, right? Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. brilliantly, it's brilliantly, you. brilliantly. And it's a beauty to watch. And it's directed by George Clooney. Oh, right. And this is not a war, war, rah, rah show at all. Oh, no, 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 no. As was not the original Catch-22. Right. Um, yeah, and I wouldn't expect that from Clooney anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's, been... it's, it's, it's quite, quite... I, I won't say I was kicking and screaming to drawn into it, into watching it, because it's, I think it's my husband's sort of lodestar book from early in life. Right. Mm-hmm. So I don't think I had a choice. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Um, do, does anybody have a Lodestar book? Uh, anybody on the call right now, is there a Lodestar book for you? I would have to say it was a Dune series. Dune, okay. Yeah, before, I would, yeah. Which I just reread. Uh-huh. I don't know if I would say a load star. I think maybe a load constellation. Yes. I like the most calculation better. A load scatter plot. Which would consist of 
Um, well, mostly science fiction, but at Dune Foundation. Um, uh, just had it in my head. Oh, um, Neuromancer and Islands in the Net, which is probably the least well known of the four. It's Bruce Sterling. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the others would sort of float in and out, um, asteroid like. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a particularly, uh, I, you know, I don't have a hero. I don't have a single book that I look at as being my inspiration. So hero protagonist is not your hero? Uh, no, although that would, be, that would definitely be one of the asteroids, um, yeah. Snow Crash. Yeah. Um, before, before Neil Stephenson got too overly in love with his own words. April, you were going to jump in? Um, it's a book I haven't read in full, but I was recommended to it and spent um, a good chunk of yesterday reviewing some of it in the quest for my own book, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, with big thanks to Todd for helping instigate a new part of that process. Um, it's a depressing book, but it's extremely well written and extremely good called This Uninhabitable Earth, or The Uninhabitable Earth. Have you guys heard of this? Um, it's not surprisingly, it is about climate change. Um, it's shockingly, shockingly good. So it sort of begins with the premise that, you know, we all think that climate change is going to be bad. And it's like, <laughs> it's going to be worse than anything any of us have imagined. So it sort of starts there, but then it, oh, I can imagine quite a bit. It, <laughs> it goes through, it focuses specifically on the human implications. So not what it means to other species, but it walks through what actually does it mean in terms of the different impacts, not just on weather patterns and whatnot, but on um, humans' ability to thrive and food systems and this, that, and the other. And then, it, but it does so in a very, it's not trying to, he's not, a, he's not an environmentalist, he's not a scientist, he's a reporter who has been collecting these stories for a long time and just got increasingly shocked that the research that was coming out, none of it was making major headlines. And even if it made major headlines, it was really being sort of packaged and delivered in a very like, oh, well, you know, at the end of the day, we'll all just have to be used, get used to it. Kind of like it was, so anyway, and not to go on about it, but the uninhabitable earth, uh, it just, I went because I was advised to look at this book for how it is structured having nothing to do with content and at the, I got sucked into the content immediately um, and the approachability and, and he does get into s solutions. Um, but I will leave it there for now. Lovely. Um, so they talk about coffee. It's written by, well, actually the guy you might actually enjoy. I took photos. Let me see. It's um, David Wallace Wells. Huh? Exactly. David Wallace Wells. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, the reason I ask, do they talk? Does he talk about coffee? That yeah. was one of the things. It's okay that uh, yeah. coffee, coffee uh, agriculture was exactly a lot about that. That it, it, with coffee. Well, a two degree, even a two degree increase in the temperatures means you cannot grow coffee anywhere in Latin America. Well, never mind what that means for what we might drink. But the economies give you a sense, and yeah. even things like. A degree, and don't quote me on whether it's two degrees or three degrees, but within the realm of not even reason, like what's kind of we already know is going to happen. Things like, for example, trees will no longer turn colors in the fall. They just kind of go brown and die, and then they come back, you know, it, stuff like that. But coffee was a big part, both the, um, from the food systems perspective, from the migration perspective, from the economic perspective. So that's, I like that you bring that up because he kind of goes around each of the different angles of a particular mm -hmm. topic. Very cool. Well, very frightening, but go ahead, Jimmy. So undoubtedly, uh, there's a lot of discussion around um, climate migration, climate refugees. Um, and actually, there, I have this sneaking suspicion that's probably, I only believe about 25% of the way, but... I find it hard to dismiss entirely that the um, oh god, something blanking on his name, the hor the Breitbart guy who was Trump's advisor, Steve know, Bannon. Bannon, the Bannon push to block out um, migrants 
was his long-term climate change climate change strategy. Wait, the what he's, was a, he's a smart. He's a smart. Uh, Bannon's policy push to aggressively block migrants mm -hmm. was his manifestation of a long-term climate strategy. He's a smart guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure he. You know, I would be surprised if he doesn't actually recognize the reality of climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And since I, I think my suspicion is that uh, climate-driven migration climate consequence driven migration um, will end up being one of the key political crises <laughs> around climate change over the next couple of decades. Um, he, you know, I think there's a non-zero chance that this was his, his stake in the ground to try to build up an infra a protective infrastructure. Um, now there's a, I'm sure there's a whole bu bunch of other stuff, you know, not, you know, not limited, to, but definitely including racism involved. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to try to make a, uh, to try to valorize what he's doing, but I think that there is actually, I think there's a chance that there's a climate element to to his policies as well that he's not talking about because that's not acceptable to that audience. But refugees, um, migrants, uh, dr driven by c climate consequences, which. Arguably, now we are Syrian civil war was a climate consequence. Um, that's going to be the, I think, is going to be one of the biggest issues that globally we have to we have to deal with over the next couple of decades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Totter St. Lodestar book. I have a, a reflection and and a book to offer. One is that as I started thinking Lodestar book and kind of activating the the internal mind map. I realized that I actually was thinking in terms of lodestar voices in my mind, in my brain, in my soul. And some of them were associated with books and some of them were not. And that, that just, just noting the shift from topic or thing to person was some classic um, distinction or observation about how minds work and then searching 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 for the book that had the most impact and seems to ramify through the years i i did come up i came up with a bunch of of books titles that actually address different stages in my life but the one book that kind of fits as lodestar is oddly enough brian arthur's book uh, called The Nature of Technology, uh, which is, I think it came out in the early aughts. And I felt that it brought together my understanding of sort of everything I'd done because he basically, among other things, he talks about the social construction of technologies within and across disciplines and how a technology solves uh, one of the set of problems that being alive um, faces humans with, which are less changing than you might think. Anyway, it sort of gave this explanation to my entire life up until that point. And then I shared it with each of my sons. It's the one, it, I think it was the first nonfiction book that I handed, right, my millennials and they were in middle school, high school at the time, both of whom became software developers. And I really think this book in, instilled um, stuff, uh, things that are their load stars, though they, they may not be aware of it that way. Hmm. Um, so I Thanks. highly recommend it. Thanks, Esty. I ordered it because it was just came up with so many references. I ordered the book. I have it. And thank you for uh, pointing me again to it. You're welcome, though. <laughs> Sweet, thank you. That's super interesting. And I, um, yeah, Brian Arthur is kind of one of these interesting figures that spits around and does interesting work. I, uh, I felt this was his sort of denouement book or um, not so much farewell, but there was something about he, at a stage in his life of saying it all mm -hmm. in, at, at at Meta, which I particularly, 
And by the way, I've mentioned Rianne Eisler in this context many times. I think she and a co-author have written that book for her that just came out this week. So I'm looking forward to something very useful. Thanks, Esty. Uh, Mr. Hoskins? I think for many years, I would have say I, I would have said the Lodestar book is Annie Dillard, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, mm. um, which in addition to just being a delight and a way of seeing nature, it's the way of seeing in the book uh, that has stuck with me for, wow, uh, I think I read it in 1996, so 23 years. Um, I can't recommend it enough. It, it's it's wonderful. Um, and some of her other works are, are good, but not as good. Uh, lately, I would say this year, 2019, I've been going back again and again to Fritjof Capra's uh, Systems View of Life um, and kind of able to see how monumental that book is. Um, in terms of how we look across different disciplines and the history, and uh, it, it's just a, had a huge impact on me. Love that, thank you. I, I noted, I'm noting these in the in the chat as we go, um, and I'll I'll. Mine is kind of um, interesting because I have a. Let me share my brain for a sec. Um, so the thing that I keep coming back to these days. Um, I don't know why, weirdly, is that in, really ancient people were a lot smarter than we think they were. And we're doing really great stuff all around the world and then got wiped out just, you know, between bugs they didn't have and uh, systematic uh, ethnocide, uh, they were gone. So, so in this batch, there's kind of three books. There's uh, 1491 and 1493 from Charles Mann. And then there's also, um, uh, where is it, The Great Estate? Uh, the biggest estate on earth. There we go. Um, so I need to actually uh, connect this to the same thought, but I haven't read this one through, but the biggest estate on earth, how our Aborigines made Australia, that basically says the same thing was happening in Australia that I had kind of absorbed from man was happening in North and South America, only it happened probably 20 or 30,000 years earlier, um, which is like mind blowing. Because uh, you think of sort of the, the, the depth of culture and how that all went. So, th so there's a bunch of those things. And then, uh, actually, let me go to um, connections. The book I always uh, point to, uh, or actually the TV series that ha I didn't never read the book, but um, Connections by James Burke was kind of my inspiration. And I don't know whether this is a lodestar or whether this is kind of a life changer. I think I think the lodestars might be a little bit different from life changing books. But I have a thought, of course, in my brain about a lot of people were affected by the whole earth catalog. Some people by powers of 10, the Ray and Charles Eames video that zooms in and out, a simple, a simple 10 minute video, but, or less than 10 minutes, I think. Uh, some people, Anne Rand and Atlas Shrugged, uh, As We May Think, uh, which is uh, that of our Bush's essay on that, that, you know, kind of foretells the intertubes. I have some friends who were influenced by the 1939 World's, New York World's Fair. It was a huge thing for them. Uh, sort of it was a, a vision of uh, America's mechanized vision for the future with technology and companies making the world better for us kind of thing. So, so this that, I was, have that under, was Futurama, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, and Clue Train actually inspired a whole bunch of people as well. So that's, that's quite interesting. So I, 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 and Star Trek and Star Wars, of course, uh, and you might sort of fit in there. I should probably put in there Dune and a couple others because clearly those are huge influences. Did you see uh, James Burke's follow on to Connections, The Day the Universe Changed? I think I watched a couple of them, but not all of them. I should go back and see. Yeah, actually, I, I found that a bit more compelling than Connections. Uh -huh. I, I think he basically had refined the technique. Uh, and so that's... That's my variation, but I think you're absolutely right that that was a um, definitive or, or catalytic bit of media yep. uh, for me. <clears throat> you know that you know recognizing the well the interconnections and and the um, 
the web of causality in a way that I think for me is, you know, illustrated in my own work and just in the, the parallels between history and historiography and foresight work. Mm -hmm. And partly the accidental yet clever juxtapositions or adjacencies that happen in history where somebody's trying to get this thing done and they're like, well, these people over here are doing something that I might be able to borrow. And that's what I loved about connections was that you'd go from unrelated thing to unrelated thing, glue them together and suddenly you've solved the problem here, which then leads somewhere completely different than, than mm -hmm. you would have thought from the, you know, from the loom, the Jacquard loom gives us punch cards in computing, et cetera, et cetera, kind of thing. That, that's uh, the Brian Arthur uh, uh, observation or one of them. I, I'm, I'm just throwing out another a suggestion here, which is that Hamilton, uh -huh. the musical has had, oh. Uh, deserves to be on that piece of your brain, right? That you were just in. Uh huh. Um, enough said. It. It. Uh, I haven't seen it, and as I was uh, describing to somebody, why I had a very short bucket list, but it was on it. Like I really feel a debt to myself. It's because I've. I feel like it has been a a, a change point. Hmm. Love that. So I'm adding um, the Dune trilogy and Hamilton to the books, movies, ideas that shape many people's lives. So yeah, foundation. And foundation trilogy should be in there as well. Sadly, I actually think Game of Thrones, the books needs to work and some of the seasons need to be there. Yeah. If we're true to, and the, uh, I think it's Zenep. I can't say her last name, so observation. Kofesky. Yeah, uh, about how it changed from the sociological to the psychological once the book went beyond, uh, the theories went beyond the books. Right. Is profound. Cool, so I'm adding a couple more things as we go. And I'm, I have to go, because I have okay. a, um, but, this has been lovely, and I'll let Todd tell you if if he feels like it. What what's going? What's Rexy in my life at the moment? Yeah. Okay, Todd. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Sounds great. Thanks, Essie. Bye. Do you want to pick up on that, Todd? Or <clears throat> uh, I think it started on a Rex call maybe uh, eight months ago, and. Esty mentioned the new grammar of productivity. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a few conversations around that with uh, Esty, uh, with Sarah Salty, who was a guest on a, a Rex call, uh, and a couple other people over time. And it's kind of um, been lying dormant, and uh, we've been checking in with each other every once in a while. Uh, and I think there's just, there's new energy, especially within Esty, um, to see uh, what is this world of relational productivity, uh, a new grammar of productivity, but not just in a theoretical form. Um, there's, she's done a bunch of writing. She has pages and pages of notes. Um, but how does this look as something tangible out into the world? Um, so I think in last month's Rex call, she mentioned that she's been looking into the idea of feminist software and uh, her passion right now, one of them, because she has multiple, uh, is, is, is combining that idea of a new grammar of productivity um, and the way that we build software, what is a relational way to both organize, build, deploy, and use um, that takes the traditional um, patriarchal forms out of it. Uh, and it's, it's a great area for discussion and debate because just even thinking about feminist software is a little bit of a mind twist for me, um, but there's, there, there's something to it. Um, is this anything parallel to decolonization movements? No, that has not come up, but I, I think that it's, 
it it is it has to be connected. Yeah, um, I'm thinking it's I'm thinking it's a close neighbor, but not the same thing. That these yes, are not, not at all yes. equivalent, but but similar yeah. kinds of things. Um, so so right now the the focus for Esty is in um, in the world of change makers, uh, people who are inside organizations, consulting to organizations. Um, how can they manage the business of life, not just the business of change or the business of business, um, with some amount of balance or flow in relation to life? So there's an exploration of um, what tools can be knit together, um, what is the moat, and this as a promotion for this afternoon's Inside Jerry's Brain Call, <laughs> what are the modes of, of communication um, that will get us further um, online? And the, there, there's, if we look at relational software, part of that has to be a more um, human, open and transparent way of communicating uh, that is risks, that avoids the risk of being capitalized. Um, so I, I I wish I could be on that call this afternoon. I would. I am definitely going to be listening to the recording because I'm. I'm curious about it, uh, and I've been spreading that around. Love that. Um, thanks, Todd. Um, it's really interesting because there's a bunch of different groups all over the place trying to figure out things like the decentralized web, and technology we trust, and a series of infrastructural questions about how can we interact without having to sell all our lives and data to these massive platforms, et cetera, et cetera. It's a you know, longer discussion, but, but it, it's, it's hard to do. It's an absolutely non-trivial problem. And taking a different aspect about ownership, connectivity, how things plug together, I think is a really nice way of re-looking at the problem. Yeah. Or the possibility. Maybe it's not the problem, but I would agree it's a problem too. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, any other thoughts on stuff that's come up so far from anybody? Groovy. Uh, April, would you like to use the group for a second to, to test any thoughts on, on writing or thinking? Sure. Um, I guess I'm glad to be able to join everybody. Um, the last few months I've been unable to participate in Rex calls mainly because I've been on the road, but um, I got home over the weekend and I'm here for the rest of the summer. And uh, yeah, Q2 was kind of off the charts in a good way, but um, it's good to reconnect with everybody. On the one hand, I'm wondering, um, I mean, probably not, a, not so much of a direct ask today, given where I am, but something to sort of put out there on the horizon. So I think some of you know, over, as of late last year, I had figured out, okay, it, it is actually finally time to write a book. And most of all, because finally I felt like it wasn't something that I was doing because they told me I needed to write a book or because um, I needed to tick something off my checklist. Um, I actually started really feeling like some kind of book was coming out of me um, and that it was, I had amassed enough ideas that I owed it to myself and I suppose to I can say to society to get those to get those ideas and connections out in a different way, and so I spent all of the winter um, drafting my first proposal, uh, and that I had gone to a, a writing workshop last year and had a table of contents and you had a, had a general sense that I was ready to do this. Spent the winter writing the first proposal. Um, sent it out end of February, sent it, and I'm giving you guys this history and context because it sort of relates, um, sent it to, came up with my wish list of agents, figured, you know, shoot as high as I can um, before anyone asks, yes, I am going the agented publisher route. I am not going to do the self-publishing right now. It's not that I don't believe in it. It's that that will be for a different book at a different time, at least touch wood, I think that's the, the deal now. So I sent it out to my sort of eight top agents. I heard back from six of them, which many people have said already, like that's pretty good. <laughs> and I got pretty consistent feedback, which was one, these, in, these ideas, this, this 
where you want to head. This is interesting, timely, relevant. Uh, second, you are the right person to write this book. Uh, third, this is a proposal for six books. Tell us what is the one book you want to write. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was frustrating. I was sort of kicking and screaming and like, just chasing. Ah. <laughs> it was also very humbling. It was also, it was just hard. But at the same time, I'm glad I heard back with that kind of feedback. And I think one of the agents that I was most um, excited by, you know, he was very clear. He said, listen, please do not send me version two in two weeks. Please take time. He's like, you've got something here. Take six months, take 12 months, take what it take, take the time and need you need to actually turn over these stones. Don't, this isn't, this isn't a quick fix. This is something you really need to probe further and you need to test ideas with other people and so forth. And so um, basically I took that to heart and right around that time, bless his heart, I think a month later, uh, Todd, sent me an email saying, I heard you mention something about your book. <laughs> I happen to know somebody who might be able to help. And um, basically, since that time, I have been doing a lot more work on figuring out what is that one book of six. But I've also been working um, with a wonderful gentleman named Tim Brandhorse, who is a literary strategist. And so he has done everything from agent books to publish them. He is a lawyer. He does foreign rights. Basically a great guy who focuses on books that have some in some relationship to social enterprise, social impact, um, and so forth. So fast forwarding to now, what's interesting is I've still got my head around the same general set of ideas, but they've been kind of reconfigured. I, I guess I would think of it as you thought you were going to build one puzzle with this set of pieces. You've still got not the same pieces, but the same the same general backdrop, but you've really reconfigured things in a way that is appealing and attractive to, I don't want to say more people, but the right people that is delivered in a different way. And that actually for me helps create a more robust and coherent platform that I can build on over time. Because I guess one, one point to mention is um, the more I learn about this, you know, sometimes people just want to write a book and write that book and be done and, and that becomes a, a sort of feather in their cap. And what I'm really hoping to do with, with this first book is to lay a foundation on which I might be able to write five or ten additional books or kinds of materials over time for different audiences. And, you know, no big surprise, the things that I'm looking at are how the ways that we are living and working and learning are changing and shifting and what that means for individuals and for companies and for um, policymakers and what that means from a global perspective and all of the things that you guys know I, I seek to embody. Um, but one of the challenges for me, for example, has been that in, as I give keynotes, and let's say I give a keynote that's broadly speaking on the future of work, right? I'm invited in to talk about what it means for business. But not nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10, the questions I get end up being, well, shit, what does this mean for my kids? Which is a very different conversation to have and not what I was asked to come do. But I, I, I share this because there's clearly a book that's for business folks. There's clearly a book that's for young adults. There's clearly a book that's for kids and for universities. And I can't do all of that at once. But those are the things that I hope to be able to do over time. So right now, um, I worked with, I've been working with Tim throughout Q2 while I've been on the road. It's been a bit crazy, but gone well. And now that I'm back, um, really as of Monday, I am diving headfirst into finishing the proposal that we've been working on, getting it into the right hands. And, you know, I, I have a ways to go because I haven't done the sample chapter or anything like that yet. But that's in a nutshell what I've been up to. Um, I would like to think that it's all very Rexy because I'm taking a non-traditional lens on some of this. And um, I'm even going to be able to fold in some of what my yoga teacher training uh, and yoga philosophy has led me to see how, I mean, I think all of us have, would agree that there's just so much that's ass backwards, if I can say that. Um, but the yoga stuff actually has given me a lot more fodder from a perspective that some people might think of as woo-woo, 
but actually when you look at it, it you can see it that way, but I, I'm not going to pitch it as yogic. I'm going to pitch it as, um, you know, a different lens or thesis that actually fits very much in line with what corporate boardrooms are talking about. But, um, you know, has a lot of the answers if we could just get our peripheral vision uh, sharper. So maybe let me pause there. I don't know, Jerry, if that's kind of what you were thinking. Um, I would love, actually, maybe what I can do is as I move forward with this writing, I would love to have any and all Rexers who are interested in reviewing parts, having a conversation about it, lending, being interviewed, as certainly being interviewed once I get to actually write the book, um, all of that open, open request. And um, yeah, no pressure, but, but that would be something to put on your radar on the, um, let's say midterm horizon. So when um, I, I get the, what does this mean for the, for my kids question quite, quite often too, when I give talks, especially when I talk about climate. Doom. You know, and it's, you know, it, it is oh. difficult not to take that approach. You say, you know, well, they're screwed. Um, Doom. <laughs> and, you know, I, you know, or I, my, my preferred way of answering along those lines is, well, they might eventually forgive, a, forgive you. Um, it's... So I'm wondering how much, when, you, when this com question comes up around work, how much do you fold in other issues, you know, whether it's climate or, or um, democracy? Mm -hmm. Depends on the setting, but as much as I possibly can. And going back to the whole doom piece, and you know, again, this is where, and Jerry has seen this, I'm really grateful uh, I'm still a bit surprised, but I've found myself in front of audiences that I just never, I, I would have seen myself as a bit of an odd fit. And they're like, no, exactly. We want somebody who has an outsider perspective. So come on in. So I've been a very like, like welcomed stranger. So I've, it's given me a little bit more leeway, but it's also helped me do sort of orthogonal thinking um, to a degree that I wouldn't expect. But I think going back to um, just a more, a more basic sentiment is that I often tell people it has to do with this ongoing uh, debate that Jerry and I have at home, which is if, and so back to the whole doom and gloom or, or not, um, if you could be 12 years old today, would you like to be 12 years old? You know, and see, I'm a little bit like, <laughs> well, see, I'm a little bit like, well, I don't know. It's, I don't, I don't, want to necessarily say that the world feels dangerous. Some days it does, but the world does feel overwhelming, right? I'm like 12 years old, like, holy crap, I don't know what to do. I don't know. Meanwhile, you've got Jerry over here in the other corner going like, I would give my left arm to be 12 years old because 12 year olds can get today with curiosity, access to basic technology and YouTube, 12 year olds can do stuff that 50 year olds couldn't do 10 years ago or with all due respect, still can't do today, right? Jerry's like, ah, and so I share this because with the parents, that's often where I kind of phrase it, which is like, we can get doom and gloom about this as fast as you'd like. And I will, you know, unvarnished it. Yeah, we're facing unprecedented unknowns and da, da, da. But also the key is if you know where to look, there are ways in which, and whether this is the workplace, whether this is solving climate, whether this is like all of these are things, if you know where to look, like the future of work, but the future of life can actually be super, super interesting. Now, that doesn't mean it's gonna be easy, but in terms of finding the solutions and making an impact and why you get up in the morning, following Jerry's lead actually, I think takes us on a very different direction. So I try to kind of hold that tension. And in terms of, is there, and I don't even want to call it an optimistic spin, but is there a positive lens we can rebrand here? Yeah, there is. Well, certainly if you're in the global top 10%, which all of us here definitely are, um, you know, I, whenever I give these talks about, you know, that may end up being doom and gloom, it's important to recognize that for a lot of us, it's not going to be doom and gloom. 
over the next few decades. Yeah. We'll, we'll be watching doom and gloom happening around the world, but we'll still be living okay. But I'm not but, convinced. So this is where, and I know that global citizenship has, you know, just as much can provoke just as much debate as a term like the sharing economy, which is like global citizen, you know, it doesn't, I feel like the track record of my career is like picking themes that sound really good, but then get co-opted <laughs> by others. But when I say raising, raising individuals or when younger people today have a much more global sense of the world, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden somehow there's more equality, but it does mean I look at this and I go, how do I want to say this? Um, Yes, a small percentage of people, but small, 10%, 20%, you know, some minority, will be just fine. I have this question of, if that many people, though, are, there's a point at which we will have, we will have a social crisis globally, a breaking point. Um, what the leaders we will need at that point in time are those that understand the interconnectedness and interdependence such that it's not that everybody ends up equally well off or equally poor off, but there is an, a, cal a much greater calibration than what we have today. And so- No dispute here. Yeah, Absolutely before agree. that, and you know, I'm, I'm not trying to boil the ocean quite as bit as much as I was in the first proposal, but I am cutting off quite a bit of of stuff to explore. And I would say where I'm focusing right now, it's really looking at new, way, new ways of learning. And in the learning piece though, it's the skills. I'm not going after necessarily the, oh, you need to be, have the, the, the technical training or the digital expertise. I'm looking at things like curiosity and empathy and tolerance and some of those softer skills, um, building a lot on the work I've been doing recently and talks I've been giving on the humanities and sort of the need for humanities in a tech-driven world, um, because that conversation in too many cases is just getting buried. But looking at making sure that as we think about the skills and the attitudes and the mindset shifts, part of which we're being forced into and part of which we need to bring ourselves into, um, looking at learning, then looking at how that, what that means or how that's related to ways of working and then more broadly ways of living and the living piece is everything from access over ownership to um possibly to e-residency but also things like um the fire movement financial independent you know lot various things where people are saying this isn't um more is better bigger is better how do we live sustainably on the planet and again people opting into that and also people being forced into that or nudged into that so let me pause there. I feel like I've been hogging the mic for a bit here, but um, anyway, and you know, feedback like this, Jume, is, is totally welcome. And if you have ideas or, or you're like, that's just not gonna work, or I don't get it, or I disagree, please. Um, um, now or down the road or whatever. And just to, just to slip in a comment before you jump, jump back in, Jame, and to pick up on what you were saying earlier about Steve Bannon, um, I think we're at this moment where people like Bannon and millenarians or you know, people who think that the sooner we break the earth, the sooner we will all be raptured off to heaven or whatever. There's a whole bunch of people who, who are on the let's accelerate the approach of doom kind of scenario for our Imm own. Imminentize the, the eschaton. Well, let's do that, exactly. And I think what that catalyzes is opportunities to rethink, reframe, and rebuild everything uh, completely differently. And that a bunch of people will be like, well, things are broken and we don't like what's, what's being offered on the menu for some of these authoritarians. How else might we come together and solve these things together? And I think it, it gives us an opportunity to counteract a lot of the crap that's changed our lives uh, in the last 50 to 100 years. Uh, it could all melt and fail, and those of us on the call here are, are privileged more than 99% of the humans on Earth, so we are less likely to suffer the direct consequences of all this stuff, um, but, but it gives us an opportunity to, to sort of put things into swing and, and try to be helpful in ways that in the 50s would have been difficult, if not fruitless. There is a line from uh, The Dark Knight the the 
the Batman <laughs> movie from a few years ago. You are going um, to quote the Dark Knight. Okay, okay. That was um, a good movie, by the way. That was a yeah. book. Where Alfred says to Bruce Wayne, some men just want to watch the world burn. <laughs> and that stuck with me because I think that there is a, a fairly sizable population, a growing population of people who are at a point of saying, fuck it all, just let it burn. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that uh, um, that was at least some of the support for Trump some of the support for Bernie. Mm -hmm. Let's break the system because the system is no longer working. The system doesn't work for me. The system is biased. The system gives too much to people I don't like. You know, whatever is the rationale, the desire to break it and then we'll deal with cleaning up afterwards, you know, or somebody else will clean it up afterwards um, or there won't be anything left to clean up afterwards. Um, that I hear that from a lot of quarters. Mm -hmm. um, Jermaine, and, I think you're right on there to me. You got to realize all these opioid deaths and the, the term that no one in America hears, uh, but you do in Europe and you do if you, you know, read the stuff that we read, deaths of despair. The suicide rate of white males without a BA is double what me, Jerry, and Jermaine, double. Those people, you think they might want to see the world burn and not give a shit? Well, they're going to kill themselves tomorrow. Of course. You know, they're already going to Valhalla. <laughs> yeah, deaths of despair. Um, mental health, global mental health crisis. Uh, the, uh, I, I think, <sighs> and I think there's a lot of indirect suicide as well. And, and I feel this just in my, in my own life of looking ahead and thinking, okay, I can, I can eat the thing that gives me a nice endorphin boost right now, the thing with extra salt or the thing with extra sugar or extra fats. Um, or I can be a good boy and not eat the, 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 the tasty stuff um, and extend my life by a few months. Um, on, oh, won't that be role. fun? <laughs> right. um, you know, and so you basically taking, making choices that have um, for short-term pleasure, knowing that they will kill you eventually, uh, as both since they're smoking. Yeah, th thanks, Jermaine. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but that's exact, it exactly. It smokes like a thing. chimney. Oh, no, 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 wait, that's by the chimney. Go ahead. Um, I want to I want to chime in here before I have to go at the top of the hour. Um, yeah, me too. And I know Janae is going to have something to say about this too. Because uh, I just can't shut up. <laughs> I think that it's it's the content, not the personality. Um, <laughs> and this is in response to what what April shared or what April brought up. Um, I think climate change is presenting us a global opportunity to work out what are perceived as differences between science and spirituality. My impression is that there's never been a crisis in which both are equally needed. And in my worldview, they are, they're not in opposition. Um, the, there's people who take a Gaia perspective, who say, trust the planet, trust Mother Earth, care for her, um, anything can happen, you just need to believe. Others who are just saying, pray, God will take care of us. Um, and then you have the scientific community uh, waving banners saying that the world is coming to an end, and both have truth. And I don't think that there is a scientific solution and I don't think there's a spiritual solution. I think it's, it requires both. And, and I wish we were having more of that conversation. And I'm actively seeking out people who are looking for and creating those conversational opportunities and moments and methods. I, I, that's really, really important. And the more I think about the jam we're in, the more I realize we have to go deep into those communities and figure out how to reattach and reconnect. 
Uh, we, um, we're probably going to wrap the call a little after the top of the hour. I think that'll make a lot of sense. Any, any sort of closing comments for where we are or advice? <laughs> Other than stay cheerful, keep away from sharp objects. Well, thank you guys. Um, I haven't actually shared a, a lot of what I've been doing. I mean, I shared tid, very small tidbits here and there. So, um, but I don't often get a comp get a chance to have a broader conversation with a group of people. So thank you. And um, I don't know, I'll say not apologies in advance, but rather I look forward to dipping back into these topics together. And, and April knows, but I'll just say it here as an invitation that, that Rex calls can be set up at any moment to explore any experiment or particular question or aspect or a, B test or whatever you'd like to do. So just, you know, say the word and we can do this or of course, you know, contact everybody individually, but totally happy to apply the Rex lens to whatever you're doing. Well, I don't and know. I hope, we'll April, I hope April uh, will take that offer as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as you're in this process, consider us here mm -hmm. um, as supporters for you. Yeah, thank you. Jimmy, thank you were saying? No, I just going to say that I don't know how much of a value I'll offer as a uh, book reviewer or reader, um, but I'm certainly happy to, to provide, to bounce ideas off of, to, pro to provide a sounding wall for some, yeah. if, if there's anything that I can provide that's relevant. Thank you. I think right now, I look forward to having a book that has been green lighted to write. <laughs> so right now it's like, that's, oh, please, yes. I think once that happens, absolutely, I will be, um, I will be reaching out. But right now it's like getting this thing done, which on the one hand, one thing I do like is uh, I have figured out in the process of this that like I was never destined to write fiction where you have to write the whole darn thing and then submit it. Uh, basically, you know, proposals are hard, but they're like business plans a little bit. And I'm like, I like this, <laughs> it gets proof, but I like it. It's just, uh, that is the lift that I'm in right now. So stay tuned. Excellent. Maybe we can like toast Rexy champagne at some point. Though. I think we'll have several toasts in the future. Yep, <clears throat> absolutely. We can, we can uh, stage gate this or whatever it's called. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to need to go at the top of the hour as well, Jerry. So. I think we I think we fold our pup tent here and uh, thank you very much. This has been great check-in. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Good to see everyone. Thanks, Good. guys. Bye. Bye all. Bye for now. Bye. Ciao, ciao. <laughs>